Welcome back to the Dabblers Den. Uh, I'm Chris Cottrell, and this is part three of my presentation on Carolina Bay Formation. Uh, this video is going to focus on the initial impact that sent a tremendous amount of ice and slush towards the coastal plains of North, uh, North America that ultimately created the Carolina Bays. Uh, to say that this was a bad day really is an understatement. Um, if you haven't seen parts one and two yet, uh, you should consider going back and watching uh, those first. There's a lot of good information there, and it'll, be, it'll definitely be worth your time. Uh, before I get into uh, what a mind-bending day it would have been, I want to make sure I give credit where credit is due once again. Uh, this information is coming from another pivotal researcher when it comes to Carolina Bays, and that's Antonio Zamora. Um, he's authored a handful of books and, more importantly, uh, peer-reviewed journal articles that you can see here. Um, I, all I'm really trying to do in this video is illustrate his work and uh, hopefully gain some public awareness. Um, I do have my own ideas related to this topic, but I'll get into those in uh, later videos. Okay, so as we start this countdown of terrifying events, it's important to note that the Earth is in a four-dimension trip around our sun, and occasionally our orbit crosses the path of other objects in space. Um, they, you know, there are a handful of comets that we can observe from Earth, uh, Halley's Comet being one, uh, Halebop, uh, you know, the don't drink the Kool-Aid Comet being another. Uh, the, these, uh, these comets travel through space and uh, over time they slowly break apart and bits and pieces get left, left behind within its orbit. Uh, so even if a comet has completely broken apart, fragments uh, can still be orbiting around our sun for tens of thousands of years. Um, when the Earth crosses these disintegrated comet orbits, we see it as a meteor shower. Uh, most of the time, these fragments are small and they quickly burn up in our atmosphere. But every now and then, T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And at T minus 0, the Earth intersects with a fragment of a comet estimated to be about 2 to 3 kilometers wide. Um, and that's, you know, that's about a mile and a half across, traveling at a speed of 111,000 miles per hour before actually, and before actually striking the Earth itself, the burning hot fragment has to pass through two miles of the Laurentide ice sheet, uh, setting off a rapid chain of events for the next 60 unimaginable minutes. Uh, the only thing that I have been able to come across that, uh, to demonstrate this impact is uh, this video uh, of an artillery barrage uh, making a low trajectory impact. Uh, the comparison here is a stretch, but uh, pay close attention to the debris pattern created by the explosion. This is the same butterfly pattern that we see with the creation of the Carolina Bays. Uh, so here, let's watch that again real quick. And you can see here the debris spreading out and being tossed much farther away from the impact site. Um, so anyways, okay, so, uh, so two seconds after the initial impact, the shock wave uh, generated a races outward at a rate of five kilometers per second, and that's 11,000 miles per hour. Um, and that's, that's just, you know, that's just the airburst alone. Uh, this video shows a shock wave created by a large explosive, which again is nothing compared to what we're talking about. Uh, but you can see uh, the amount of energy that's transferred in all directions. <laughs> okay, so, so, you know, obviously, you know, even though it's just air moving, it's, it's has a lot of force behind it. Um, and these, these photos over here, these show an entire forest near Tunguska, Russia, um, that was flattened by an airburst back in 1908. And this is from a much smaller fragment that exploded in the air, uh, sending a shockwave down and, uh, you know, completely flattened this entire forest here. Uh, and I can only imagine the devastation if it actually made it all the way to the ground. All right, at T plus 20 seconds, huge ice boulders and giant slush balls, some the size of athletic stadiums. Um, these were ejected from the impact site at just under 9,000 miles an hour. Uh, and these are just now starting to reach the upper atmosphere at 20 seconds. Uh, 10 seconds later, at T plus 30 seconds uh, after initial impact, the water and steam uh, that was ejected above the Earth's atmosphere turns into tiny ice crystals, and this is going to begin to to shroud the planet of of the Earth in a in you know in a low Earth orbit, uh, and begin to block out the sun. 
Uh, it only took four minutes for the shock wave again re at traveling at 11,000 miles per hour to reach the uh, east coast. Uh, and this is going to be flattening any exposed forest along the way. Uh, these photos down here show the effects of Mount St. Helens lateral blast. Uh, and it was only traveling at 300 miles an hour. Uh, so at 11,000 miles an hour, uh, devastation would have been very widespread. Uh, the immediate shock to the unconsolidated soils of the coastal plain would have likely began liquefaction. Again, that's where the, the molecules or the, uh, the sediment starts to shake and, and liquefies. 7 minutes after the initial impact those huge ice boulders and slush balls begin crashing back down to the earth uh, these secondary impactors have re-entered the atmosphere at a velocity of Mach 11 uh, with as much as 3 megatons of energy uh, and just for a frame of reference the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima was only 0 0.015 megatons um, the sonic booms of each new impactor uh, and the impacts themselves would have amplified the liquefaction of the coastal plain and any plants or animals in this area uh, that survived the initial shock wave would have likely been destroyed, um, you know, in the entire area. Uh, this will continue for the next three minutes. At T plus 10 minutes, uh, the secondary bombardment of these icy impactors ends, leaving almost two feet of ice over the solid ground in huge elliptical craters within the liquefied sediments of the coastal plain. Uh, and these will later become the Carolina Bays. Well, 20 minutes after the initial impact, the sonic booms of the secondary impacts finally rumble to an end. Um, the instantly transformed landscapes of the North American uh, continent become eerily quiet. Um, 38 minutes later, at T plus 58 minutes, the terrifying sound of the initial impact rips through the east coast of North America, ushering in an extension of the Ice Age for the next thousand years or so. Uh, and I'll get more on this later. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this video now. Uh, you know, again, while this is somewhat speculative, uh, this is the best explanation that I've come across to help explain the formation of the Carolina Bays. Um, and next time we'll get into a little bit more about when this event would have occurred. Um, there are some conflicting uh, ideas, and uh, we'll get into that, and I'll talk about what I think is the uh, most probable timeline for the Carolina Bay Formation. And uh, thanks again for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.